Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Palm Springs Drive Church of Christ, where we worship God, study His Word, love one another, and reach the lost. If you're visiting with us, we're so pleased that you have come. Uh, we do have some visitors uh, that uh, mean a lot to us that we've not seen uh, in a while. We've got Melody uh, Dow uh, has come uh, to visit, and uh, we've got the Black Welders in town. Um, and we have some who have been unable uh, to get out because of COVID, who have also been worshiping with us. I'm so glad to see Marianne Rubright back with us, uh, and Carol Van Cleef, and now uh, Miss B. Debo as well, I see. So really good to see all of you. I, I, I do want to also say I appreciate Dwayne's um, transparency and vulnerability this morning. Um, our hearts are with you and your family, and our prayers are with you and your family at this time. I'll just tell you, unless you're a full-time preacher, you don't really appreciate how difficult um, what Dwayne had to do this morning was to present a lesson before the Lord's Supper and to teach a Bible class on some hard material, by the way, <laughs> and to do that while being in the hospital all week uh, with his father and to have this diagnosis of his father on top of all that. Uh, we just really are sympathetic and, and empathetic, and we appreciate your willingness to continue uh, working even though it's it's not a good circumstance and not what you were hoping for when you first came here. So we, we just want to extend that to you. Acts 23. Acts 23 is where we're going to be this morning. As we talk about putting God on trial. Acts 23. Let's look in verse 27 through 29. These are familiar verses to you. This is the commander Lysias as he sends Paul to the governor Felix. He sends a letter with him so that he can anticipate Paul's arrival. And he says in verse 27, when this man was arrested by the Jews and was about to be slain by them, I came up to them with the troops and rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman. And wanting to ascertain the charge for which they were accusing him, I brought him down to their council. And I found him to be accused over questions about their law, but under no accusation deserving death or imprisonment. You know, throughout history, mankind has always put God on trial. I think about Job, probably the most classic example of questioning God and the way that God was doing things. And he just thought, if I could just stand trial, if I could have a case with God and present my case, God will see that I'm right here and what he's doing is, is wrong. And God appears to him at the end of that book and reminds him, are you the creator, Job? Were you there when the, when the earth was established? Were you there? Did you create all of the creatures of the earth? And he reminds Job that he knows exactly what he's doing. He is the creator of the universe. And he asked Job this question. The Lord said to Job, will the fault finder contend with the almighty? Let him who reproves God answer it. And then Job answered the Lord and said, behold, I am insignificant. What can I reply to you? I lay my hand on my mouth. And that wasn't the last time God was put on trial. I think about Uzzah. He reaches out, touches the ark to keep it from falling off that cart. They were using to carry it. God strikes him dead. David is furious with God. He's angry. He thinks that's not right. That's not fair. How could you, how could you strike Uzzah dead? He was just you know, trying to do the right thing to keep the ark from falling, only later to learn they weren't obeying God at all. They were not supposed to be carrying the ark on a cart at all. They were violating all kinds of God's laws there. And... They were proved to be the guilty ones. In Isaiah's day, Isaiah prophesied that the Jews are going to go into captivity 70 years to Babylon. But God was going to raise up a foreign king named Cyrus, a Persian king who would set them free. Well, the Jews didn't really like that plan. And so they argued with God about it. And in Isaiah, Isaiah 45, verse 9, the first part, says, Woe to the one who quarrels with his maker. An earthenware vessel among the vessels of the earth. Will the clay say to the potter, what are you doing? All throughout scripture, the clay accuses the potter of wrongdoing and are proved wrong themselves in the process. And you fast forward a thousand years, Jesus comes on the scene. God comes to the earth in the flesh and they put him on trial too. They accuse him of evil. And what was the verdict from Pilate? I find no guilt in this man. And now you have Paul in the book of Acts 
through whom Jesus is working by the power of the Holy Spirit, and they put Paul on trial. And in Acts 23 that we just read, the commander Lysias says, Man, these accusations are false. I, I can't put him to death. He, there's no guilt here. He's innocent. And that verdict is only confirmed in Paul's continual trials to, before Felix and before Festus and before Agrippa I and eventually before Caesar himself. Last week I warned about what's called progressive Christianity. And this is kind of a part two of that lesson because many people adopt progressivism as a result of putting God on trial. They read some verse or some passage that they find highly offensive to them. And they think that God is an immoral monster. They become fault finders. They contend with the Almighty. And they think, look, in our more evolved moral sophistication, we can clearly see the Bible writers must have been wrong in their understanding of God. This morning, I want to give you three main subjects that offend people to the point of falsely accusing God and then questioning the reliability of the, of the Bible, which moves them into progressive Christianity and many times into full-on atheism. But I started the lesson the way I did because it, it is okay to have questions. It is okay to have concerns. It is okay to read some things in the Bible and not really you know, have a lot of positive, happy, good feelings about it. But we need to be very careful not to falsely accuse and put God on trial simply because we don't like the way he does things. One writer said this, it's worth writing down, I should have put it on your outline. The gospel is about making man right with God, not making God right with man. The gospel is about making man right with God, not making God right with man. The progressive movement says the God of the Bible isn't good and we need to fix him and make him right. That's a big problem. And that leads to this main lesson that when we put God on trial, he is exonerated and we are the ones who are found guilty. Every time throughout history, someone tries to put God on trial. This is what happens. He's proved innocent. And then his accusers are exposed as the ones who are in the wrong. And here are three examples of that. Kind of heavy uh, lesson this morning. Some difficult subjects. Number one, slavery. When modern readers see rules about slavery in the Old Testament, our minds go back to the horror of slavery in America where people were kidnapped and taken from Africa against their will, sold as slaves to be used as tools, to be hated, degraded, treated like animals for the color of their skin, ripped away from their families at slave auctions, physically, verbally, and even sexually abused by their masters. And so when people read in the Old Testament that God has laws about slavery, they say, there's no way I can serve a God like that. They put God on trial and accuse him of immorality. But let me show you why God is innocent and why the accusers need to do what Job did and put their hands over their mouths. Number one, God saved Israel from cruel slave owners. Would you look with me in Exodus? Exodus chapter 3, please. Exodus chapter 3. In Exodus, Pharaoh had enslaved God's people for 430 years, and they were cruel, harsh taskmasters. And listen to what God says about this. In Exodus 3, verse 7 through 9, the Lord said, he's speaking to Moses here from the burning bush, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I've given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their sufferings. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. And now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me. Furthermore, I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. Here's my question. Why would God, who hates oppression by cruel slave owners. 
then give his people who he just set free from slavery laws that would make them become the cruel slave owners instead? And the answer is he would not. <laughs> in fact, many times when God teaches people in his law how to treat others, he uses their slavery in Egypt as the basis for it. So, for instance, he says, you shall not oppress a stranger since you yourselves know the feelings of a stranger, for you also were strangers in the land of Egypt. God wants his people to have empathy toward others because they know what it's like to not have any empathy shown toward them. And not only does God want his people not to oppress people, it goes further than that. In Leviticus 19.34, the stranger who resides with you shall be to you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself. For you were aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Does this sound like an immoral monster to you? God wanted his people to treat everyone with dignity and with honor and with love because they know what it's like to not have people treat them that way for 430 years in Egypt. So any discussion that we have with anybody about God's laws concerning slavery must be set in the proper context of the God who set an entire nation free from slavery and really does not want them to ever become like their oppressors. With that said, let's move further and show that slavery in the law was not like slavery in America. Look in Exodus 21. We'll be in this chapter for a little bit. In Exodus 21, <clears throat> a lot of stuff about slavery here. This chapter is very detailed. Some sections are kind of complex, but I just want to hit some highlights. In Exodus 21, it says this in verse 2, If you buy a Hebrew slave, he shall serve for six years, but on the seventh he shall go out as a free man without payment. Unlike American slavery, slavery in the law was voluntary. It was a voluntary contract to work. It was not based on skin color. It was not based on treating someone as an inferior race. It happened when you did not have much money. You were in a tight situation financially, and so you would agree to work for a wealthy person for a certain period of time under this contract. If you were uh, a Hebrew, that contract was limited to six years, and then you could go free. And sometimes what would happen is once the contract was over, they would choose to stay with their master for life if they really enjoyed working under that master. Look in Exodus 21, 16. He who kidnaps a man, whether he sells him or he is found in his possession, shall surely be put to death. American slavery, the entire system was built on kidnapping. And God says, if you kidnap someone, you die. And not only that, even if you're not the one who did the kidnapping, if you are taking advantage of a kidnapped person, you die. God took human rights and dignity very seriously. And in fact, when you look at the ancient world and the other you know, law systems, if you want to call them that, that existed at the time, there was no law like the law of Moses that treated people with the dignity that the law of Moses did. Look in Exodus 21 in verse 26 and 27. 26, if a man strikes the eye of his male or female slave and destroys it, he shall let him go free on account of his eye. And if he knocks out a tooth of his male or female slave, he shall let him go free on account of his tooth. In other words, if you abuse your slave in any way, they can go free. Masters did have the right to discipline their slaves. You know, if a slave was refusing to work or maybe if a slave stole from them or disgraced their family in some way, you could discipline a slave. But God says, if that discipline turns out to be abuse, that slave's free. And there are other laws about how if a slave runs away from their master, you are not allowed to return that slave to their master. You have to actually take that slave in and take care of them. Because the assumption is, well, the reason they ran away is because it wasn't a really good master. Now, let me give you the two verses that offend people the most, that really set people off and cause people to accuse God of being a monster. This is Exodus 21, same chapter. Look in verses 20 and 21. 
If a man, verse 20, strikes his male or female slave with a rod and he dies at his hand, he shall be punished. If, however, he survives a day or two, no vengeance shall be taken, for he is his property. <laughs> now, without any knowledge of the context of the Bible or the law of Moses as a whole, it sounds, it sounds like he's saying if a master strikes his slave and he dies after two days, well, that's no big deal because he's his property and he can do whatever he wants to him. That's not what's happening here. These verses are a contrast between murder, which is intentional killing, and manslaughter, which is accidental. God always distinguishes between the two in the law. Masters, again, were allowed to discipline their slaves. But if that master struck his slave so that he died on the same day, it's probably an indication that he was trying to kill his slave. And if that's the case, the master will be punished. And by that, it means the master will be put to death. Because verse 12 in the same chapter says, He who strikes a man so that he dies shall be put to death. So the master, you discipline your you kill your slave intentionally out of anger, you die for that. But if the master, you know, he disciplines a slave and maybe he maybe he does so a little too hard and causes some damage unbeknownst to him, some internal damage, and the slave he lives for a few days, but but the slave ends up dying. The, the indication there is that that was unintentional. That he was not trying to kill that slave. And when it says, for he is his property, that does not mean, well, he gets to do whatever he wants to him. We know that's not true. We already saw the other verses that talk about abusing slaves going free. It means that slave is a great asset to him. And he's going to suffer great loss when that slave dies. The, the word for property is literally money. It means that slave is like money to him. And so when that slave dies, the punishment on that master is going to be all that money he's going to lose from the amount of help and work that that slave was doing for him. And I would just add this, especially because if he killed his slave accidentally, he would have to deal with the feelings of guilt over that for the rest of his life. So there's a lot of punishment built in already for that case. But it's not about treating a slave however you want because he's your property. I mean, that, that's totally out of context of the law and the Bible as a whole. And finally, God allowed slavery but didn't endorse it. Notice almost every verse in this chapter starts with the word if. That means this is case law. It means in case these things happen. There's a difference between God regulating what happens if you own a slave and God commanding you and saying, you know, I really want you to own slave. That, that's what I really want from you. Big difference. I'll just show you that. We already read one uh, earlier, but l let's look at a different um, verse, same chapter, uh, verse 18 and 19. If men have a quarrel and one strikes the other with a stone or with his fist, and he does not die but remains in bed, if he gets up and walks around outside on his staff, then he who struck him shall go unpunished. He shall only pay for his loss of time and shall take care of him until he is completely healed. Now, would anyone read this verse and say, this means God is commanding us to strike each other with stones unless we die? <laughs> no. He's saying, if this happens... If somebody strikes somebody with, with a stone, God doesn't want people striking people with stones. But if you do that because you disobey the Lord, and you're doing what you're not supposed to. Here's what you do when that happens. Jesus made this point of distinction in Matthew chapter 19 with Moses's law about divorce. Because the law there is a case law and it talks about if a man writes a woman a certificate of divorce. And the Pharisees thought that meant, well, God, God's endorsing divorce. You know, Moses commands us to write her a, a, a certificate of divorce. And Jesus says, no, it was never God's design for people to get divorces. He was just regulating it to keep it from getting out of control because of the hardness of your hearts. Likewise, I don't believe it was God's ideal plan for people to own other people as slaves. Ideally, People, even under the law system, should be able to support themselves on their own land. They wouldn't have to go into debt, and they wouldn't be in you know, horrible financial conditions, but maybe sometimes they were through poor financial choices of their own, maybe through natural disaster, and God makes concession for that. It says, look, if you're in a tight spot and you need to sell yourself into slavery to, to pay off debt or to make some money, then, then yeah, you can do that. But he says... If you're going to practice slavery, this is how it better look. 
because you better not be oppressing each other like the Egyptians oppressed you. And let me throw in this last point here. Philippians 2, 7 and 8 talks about Jesus emptying himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Here's an amazing thing. You can complain all you want about, about slavery and God, maybe he shouldn't even talked about slavery in, in the law at all. God himself was willing to come in the flesh and become a slave for our benefit. Jesus said he came not to be served, but to serve, to be our servant. And yet we beat and abused and murdered our servant on a cross. Yet he was willing to endure that so that we could be set free from our spiritual slavery to Satan. And he did it to show us what it means to have the humility to purposely lower ourselves to the position of a slave in our service to others. So don't get me wrong here. It may not be God's plan that, that people own each other as slaves, but it is God's ideal plan for us to become servants like Jesus, to willingly humble ourselves put ourselves in that position and treat others like they're our master. Treat others like I'm here for your good and your benefit. And of course, to become a servant to God himself. When we put God on trial, he is exonerated and we are found guilty. Secondly, holy violence. The Old Testament reveals major acts of violence on God's part, like the flood where he destroys the whole world except Noah and his family, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah with fire and brimstone, and probably the most popularly attacked example is when he tells the Israelites to destroy the Canaanites, men, women, and children, which many interpret today as genocide. You remember the progressive writer Peter Inns from last week's lesson? He said this, the Bible is an ancient book, and we shouldn't be surprised to see it act like one. So seeing God portrayed as a violent tribal warrior is not how God is, but how he was understood to be by the ancient Israelites communing with God in their time and place. The progressives put God on trial. They accuse him of being a violent, bloodthirsty warlord guilty of genocide. But let me show you why God is innocent and that his accusers should do like Job and put their hands over their mouths. And we'll use the destruction of the Canaanites since it is the most popularly attacked today. Number one, this was about God's judgment for disobedience. Would you look in Deuteronomy, please? Deuteronomy chapter 9. Deuteronomy chapter 9. God says this to his people in verse 5. Deuteronomy 9, 5, it is not for your righteousness or for the uprightness of your heart that you are going to possess their land, but it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord your God is driving them out before you in order to confirm the oath which the Lord swore to your forefathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, genocide really is about tribalism. It's about a thirst for power. It's about my tribe. It's better than your tribe. And so we're going to take your land so that we can be the ones in power. This was not that. God wasn't giving Israel the land because they were a superior tribe, but because he's punishing the Canaanites for their sin. These people were idolaters who engaged in twisted sexual practices, even sacrificed their own children in the fire to their gods. God was carrying out justice against them. Even in our courts today, murderers get thrown in jail for life or the death penalty, and we don't call that violence. We call that justice for wrongdoing. Secondly, God applied the same standard to the Israelites. Look earlier in Deuteronomy 7, Deuteronomy 7, Verse 2 through 4, when the Lord your God delivers them before you and you defeat them, you shall utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them and show no favor to them. Furthermore, you shall not intermarry with them. You shall not give your daughters to their, uh, to their sons, nor shall you take their daughters for your sons, for they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. And the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and he will quickly destroy you. This wasn't genocide where God, you know, he, he thinks the ethnicity of the Canaanites is they're just an inferior race. And he just really likes the Israelites a lot better. No, 
This is about the Canaanites' spiritual rebellion against God. And God says to his own people, Israel, if you commit the same spiritual rebellion, then I'll, I'll treat you like the Canaanites too. I'll destroy you like I'm destroying the Canaanites. Thirdly, God gave them 400 years to repent. Way back in Genesis 15, when God is speaking to Abraham, he says, I'm not going to give this land to your descendants yet. It's going to be like 400 years before they actually take it because the iniquity of the Amorite or the Canaanite is not yet complete. That means God was patient. It means God did not fly off the handle. He did not throw a cosmic temper tantrum. Nine times in the Old Testament, we find this description of God. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. He's not a violent warlord. He's patient and kind and willing to forgive. And here he was long suffering toward the Canaanites for 400 years. And get this, even willing to allow his own people to suffer in Egypt for 400 years if it meant giving the Canaanites more time. You know, if the Canaanites moved into your neighborhood, you'd want them gone right away. And you'd be angry if the cops didn't come and do something about all that nonsense that was going on. Yet God let them be for 400 years in his patience. But God is also a just judge who will not let the guilty go unpunished forever. And it was time for their judgment. I've rarely done this. I'm going to pause for a second. Um, I don't know if we can turn the AC down. I'm very hot. I'm seeing other people warm. I'm losing people, I'm dropping like flies. So I don't know if everybody just stayed out late. But I noticed that last week, too, everybody had fans out and were fanning themselves. I don't know. It's just a little warm in here. So um, if we can maybe turn the air down or something, that would be helpful. All right, we got an amen for that. So, uh, and that's from an elder. An elder amened it, so we got to do it. We, we must submit to our elders. Let's do it. <clears throat> I think it just happens when it's cold outside, and our, you know, our body temperatures get thrown off, and we come in here, and it's just, anyway. Those who repented were spared. When they did come to the land of Canaan to destroy the Canaanites... Remember Rahab, she comes out and says, hey, you know, we've heard about this God and we, you know, we want to be right with you. Please spare me. Please spare me and my household. And they did. And I just I can't help but imagine what would have happened if the entire city of Jericho came out and said, hey, you're going to save her. Save us too, please. We, we heard about this God. We want to serve you. We don't want to be wrong on the wrong side of this God. But those who repented were spared. And I imagine if other people repented, they would have been spared as well. And here's the hardest part. We can freely admit this. This is hard. Deuteronomy 2, verse 34. Deuteronomy 2, verse 34 talks about their destruction of King Sihon and his city. Verse 34. We captured all his cities at that time and utterly destroyed the men, women, and children of every city. We left no survivor. We can understand God punishing the Canaanites for their sin. But how could God allow innocent children to be killed? The point is, it's an extension of the punishment on the Canaanites for their sin. That he is blotting out their names from the earth. God was not punishing the children because the children were guilty. He was punishing the Canaanites who had been so wicked for so many hundreds of years that God, God did not want any legacy of the Canaanites left behind. If he allows the children to live on, then a piece of the Canaanites lives on as well. And not to mention, depending on the age of those children, some of those children, if they're teenagers, depending on how we're talking about them, they can be bad influences on the Israelites and turn them to, to idol worship. But the smallest of children, babies who were, who were genuinely innocent, that was part of the punishment on the Canaanites. It's a, hard, it's a hard pill to swallow. We can admit that's, that's hard to hear. That's difficult. But you know, it teaches us the seriousness of sin. It teaches us the fact that your sin, I'm going to say your, I'm not a parent, but your sin as parents can have an effect on your innocent children. And one comforting thought here is to know the Bible teaches God will bring innocent children to heaven with him. So it may be true that they were casualties of this war. Their bodies were killed as a result of their parents' sin, but they are still very much alive and well with God. 
And finally, this wasn't the norm. These rules about utter destruction really only applied to the Canaanites uh, and then later to the Amalekites because the Amalekites ambush Israel as they came out and attack them as they were leaving Egypt. And God said, I, I want to make sure that their name is blotted out as well for their crime. It wasn't like God just sent his people on a rampage and said, all right, take over the world. <laughs> Go kill everybody and take their land. No, the land of Canaan, if, if you look on a map, is a relatively small piece of land. And that punishment was a unique judgment on their sin for their 400 years of rebellion. It was not also God's norm to just strike people dead on the spot every time that they sinned. You might read about that in the Old Testament and seem like, well, it's a lot. But you don't necessarily realize how many decades or how many years or sometimes centuries pass in the text that you're, that you're reading. It's why... That verse about his patience and loving kindness is repeated nine times in variations on that verse, praising God for his grace, praising God for his loving kindness, praising God for his mercy is repeated hundreds of times in the Old Testament. This idea that the God of the Old Testament, he was just this harsh, judgmental, hate filled God. But then the God of the New Testament, well, he's just he's just all love. That's a false dichotomy. God has always been love. He's always been merciful and faithful and kind to people, but he's also always been a God of justice. And in the Old Testament, if you do the math, his mercy and his grace far outweighs the times that he brought down judgment on people for their sin. And as much as progressives want to believe that, they still put God on trial for this because it's just too hard to consider the horror of a God who would allow innocent children to be killed for someone else's sin. And again, I can sympathize with that feeling, but perhaps one of God's purposes in allowing those children to die was to produce outrage in us because we know it's not fair for innocent children to have to suffer for other people's sins so that when Jesus came to die for our sins, we would have that same outrage and realize we are the Canaanites. It was our sin that caused the death of the innocent Son of God. That's not right. And that's not how it's supposed to be in progressive. That's why they remove that. They remove this idea of Jesus dying for our sins because they think that is, that is awful and that's not how things sh should be either. But if God really did things the way that they were supposed to be done, he would have destroyed us like the Canaanites for our sins as well. But God is slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness, and by the power of the cross, he shows mercy to us like Rahab and her household and forgives us of our sins. When we put God on trial, he is exonerated and we are found guilty. And finally, hell. I shared last week a couple quotes from progressives like Richard Rohr and Rob Bell who believe any God who would send people to a place of eternal torment is a monster. And again, we can sympathize with not feeling good when we read about hell. That's a disturbing thing. But let me show you why God is innocent and the accusers should put their hands over their mouths like Job did. First of all, he sent Jesus to save us from hell. You know, progressives have a big problem here because as we showed last week, they choose Jesus's teaching. They elevate his teachings over the rest of scripture. And many times they'll pit Jesus against the God of the Old Testament and show how the God of the Old Testament needs to be reinterpreted and reinvented in light of what Jesus taught. Well, if you take that position, that's difficult when it comes to the subject of hell because Jesus talked about hell more than anybody. And Jesus said in Matthew 10, 28, do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. He paints a scene of judgment in Matthew 25, where he says, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. What we see here is hell's original purpose was a place of punishment for Satan and his angels. Humans do not belong there. Humans are not supposed to go to this place. And God does not want us in hell. And we know that because he sent his son to save us from going there. That's how much, according to John 3.16, he loved the world. That he gave his only son so that we would not perish, 
eternally. 1 Timothy 2, 4, he desires all men to be saved. Well, saved from what? Well, saved from hell for one, and also saved from our, the practice of our sin and the, all, the, all the other things that come with not being a Christian. If God were a monster, he would be rubbing his hands together in excitement, saying, I, I can't wait to roast them. I can't wait to throw these people in hell. But even in the Old Testament, you have verses in Ezekiel 18 where he says, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, what I want is for them to repent so that I can bless them. He wants everyone saved. He sent Jesus to die to make that possible. And then he sends the apostles and he sends Christians to go out in the world and beg people to be saved. He does everything that he can without removing people's free will to keep them out of hell at all costs. Secondly, We don't have to go there. You know, blaming God for the existence of hell is like blaming judges for the existence of prison. You don't have to go to prison. You go to prison if you commit a crime. Likewise, we don't have to go to hell. We can be saved from hell if we follow Jesus. Thirdly, without hell, there's no ultimate justice. Without hell, it means that Hitler, for instance, got away with his crimes. It means in the end that the terrorists on 9-11 are no worse off than the rest of the people in the plane that they brought down with them because death is the end and that's it. Uh, One uh, Croatian theologian reflected on his change of heart about hell and about God's wrath after the Bosnian War. He said this. He's not a progressive, so I switched up the background a little bit so I was not to confuse people. Uh, I used to think that wrath was unworthy of God. Isn't God love? My last resistance to the idea of God's wrath was a casualty of the war in former Yugoslavia, the region from which I come. According to some estimates, 200,000 people were killed and over 3 million were displaced. My villages and cities were destroyed. My people shelled day in and day out, some of them brutalized beyond imagination. And I could not imagine God not being angry. Though I used to complain about the indecency of the idea of God's wrath, I came to think that I would have to rebel against the God who wasn't wrathful at the sight of the world's evil. God isn't wrathful in spite of being love. God is wrathful because God is love. We try to pit God's love and his justice apart, but they are two sides of the same coin. As God loves us so dearly, it angers him when he sees us wronged, when he sees people rebelling and mistreating others. And those people must be punished if they refuse to repent. Otherwise, God is not a just judge and everybody just gets away with it in the end. Psalm 37 says, depart from evil and do good so you will abide forever. For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his godly ones. They are preserved forever, but the descendants of the wicked will be cut off. Zephaniah 3, 5, they have done violence to the law. The Lord is righteous. He will do no injustice. Every morning he brings his justice to light. He does not fail, but the unjust knows no shame. God cannot have any part of injustice, and that means he must punish the wicked who don't repent. And God will ensure that the punishment fits the crime. One, one reason hell bothers people so much is because they don't see how hell fits the crime. You know, what, what's the big deal? If, if I just commit one lifetime full of sin, how is that worth an eternity of punishment? And I think by asking that question, I think we can relate because we're all physical beings, right? We, that sounds kind of logical. But at the same time, it exposes the fact that we don't take sin seriously enough. We think God is just overreacting. He's just being overdramatic. He doesn't really have to have to punish people for sin. But the cross of Jesus Christ shows us it absolutely is that serious, the sin problem. And the second objection people have to hell about this idea of the punishment not fitting the crime is they think, you know, for instance, uh, I don't know, a, a kind aunt that you have who's just, she's just always doing good deeds, you know, trying to treat people well, but she rejects Jesus. And the, the thought is, well, how in the world is it that, that your kind aunt who treats everybody with kindness, she receives the exact same punishment as Hitler or other mass murderers? I don't think that's biblical, folks. Look in Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12 with me. <clears throat> and I'll be careful like Adam was when Adam taught this 
in Bible class a while back. He, you know, he was careful not to be too dogmatic about this, but I think this just makes perfect sense. But Jesus warns us about being entrusted with the household of our master until he returns and that we need to take that responsibility seriously. And he says this in 45 to 48, if that slave says in his heart, my master will be a long time in coming and begins to beat the slaves, both men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk. By the way, there's another passage about not mistreating slaves. Uh, verse 46, the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him, and in an hour he does not know, and will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. And that here's the two main verses. And that slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accord with his will will receive many lashes. But the one who did not know it and committed deeds worthy of a flogging will receive but few. From everyone who has been given much, much will be required, and to whom they are entrusted much of him, they will ask all the more. This seems to indicate that there are varying degrees of punishments in hell. That would make sense of Jesus' statements to some people that you will receive greater condemnation for your sin than others. And often that's in the context of people who should know better, like the religious leaders. But it makes perfect sense to me in other areas as well, especially when you consider in the Old Testament, in the law of Moses, God did not assign the same punishment for every sin. There were different punishments assigned for different levels of guilt. And that's how it is in our justice system. That's how it is in every system of justice. And we get our concept of justice from God who is perfectly just. And so I don't believe that God is going to be doling out the exact same punishments to every single person in hell. But do not misunderstand. Hell will be awful for everyone there. It is described as a place of fire, a place of darkness, weeping, gnashing of teeth, and we must avoid it at all costs. But the existence of hell does not make God a moral or an immoral monster. It makes him a just judge who has done everything he can to warn us and, and send his son and plead with us to save us from getting what we deserve in hell. But in the end, if that's what we choose and we reject Jesus, God will give it to us. And I want to say this final thing, we, we may still feel at the end of the day like we have a bone to pick with God. And we may put God on trial and say, I don't like the way you do things, God. If I were running the universe, I wouldn't have even mentioned slavery. And I wouldn't even have even ever put someone to death for sin. I would never create a, a place called hell. And I would save everyone. But the problem is, we aren't God. We are earthenware vessels. We are the clay arguing and contending with our maker. And when we put him on trial, we only expose our own ignorance and we expose our very casual attitude towards sin. And we are found guilty. It is okay to have questions. It's okay to not always understand everything God does and to not always have good, happy feelings about everything God does, but we enter dangerous territory when we put God on trial and falsely accuse Him of evil and then decide we need to reinvent Him and we need to reinvent His Word to better suit us. That's when we need to humbly do what Job did and put our hands over our mouths. The gospel is about making man right with God, not about making God right with man. And what we know about God is that he loved us so much that he sent his son to die on a cross so that we could be made right with him. An immoral monster would never do that. In the end, the truth is we are the immoral monsters. And yet God loved us and was so slow to anger that he sent Jesus to save us anyway. Do you know this God? The God who is slow to anger merciful, compassionate, abounding in loving kindness. You can know him this morning if you'll put your faith in his son and be baptized for the remission of your sins. If you've done that already and you've wandered away because you can't square things in your own heart and your mind with what you read about in the Bible and maybe you have some issues with God, come talk to me about that. Let's study that out together. This sermon was much longer than most of my sermons. But we could have gone into so much more detail. So much more could be said about this subject. So if you want to know more about that and you're struggling with your faith, come talk to me about it. Let's study. Let's dig deeper. We're here to help you be right 
with God. If we can help you do that, come forward and let us know how while we stand and sing. Oh, to Jesus, I...